makes no difference. There is nothing fundamental about physical or non-physical in a reality system. That's really the next relativity where reality frames are relative to the perception of the observer. Okay, the last point that we're going to hit before wrapping up is video lag. It's going to give us some more science here. A virtual reality has a problem with video lag. You know that if you play these games. And what video lag means is that the server sends out data, but your system's slow, and it takes a long time to catch up with the server. Well, we have that problem in consciousness as well. You see, what's slow in, this, in, this, in our reality? It's us. It's the electrochemical, physical processes that we have to initiate are slow compared to the data, which means the mental processes, which are much faster. Okay, so here's what, here's what happens. First, let me define little c and big C. Um, big consciousness, big C consciousness is a larger conscious system. Okay, that larger conscious system is the one sending the data. You get the data, you interpret that data, and then that's what I call your local awareness. That's your individual local little c consciousness. Okay, it's different. Okay, the uh, uh, little c consciousness is nothing but a shadow of big C consciousness. All right, well, an optimal design here would be to remove this video lag is to, there's two things you can do. You can either speed up the process or you can move it further back in time. Those are the two things that cause video lag. It's either that you're slow or you're the last in line to get the data. World of Warcraft, you're both. Your system's slower than the server and you're the last in line to get the data. After the server computes it, you get it at the end. Okay, now with, in a consciousness system, we can't change slow. Slow is an artifact of the rule set. That's our bodies. We have electrochemical, mechanical processes that are just slow. Nothing we can do about it because that's what the rule set says we have to have. But we can change that we're not last in line. And how do we do that? Remember the future probable reality database? Here's the way a consciousness system, it would seem, should work, is that it would look at those probable future realities and start that slow body moving first. Get that body, that electrochemical processes in motion, okay? before they even have the, make the choice with their free will. Then they get to the part where they make the choice with their free will, and if they choose something other than what was predicted, well, now they're going to be a little clumsy because they got a body starting to do one thing, and now they've decided to do something else. But most of the time, that doesn't happen. Most of the time, that doesn't happen. Okay, then, after you've made your choice, then, at last, the big C consciousness generates the data set that creates the little c consciousness. So now little c consciousness is the, is the tail end of this dog, and the body starts out early. That's so that the slow thing can get a head start. All right, well, what do we, this tells us some things that we can run against science and against fact. For one, what it tells you that if you are very conflicted, if you're fearful, if you're uncertain and tentative, your choices are harder to anticipate and that makes you clumsy. Okay, now here's, uh, here's a, uh, an example of that. Um, well, for one, athletes. Any top-notch athletes at Olympic quality athlete will tell you that the game's about 80% mental. They really have to be focused on the outcome. When that archer lets that arrow fly, he's not thinking about how he's holding the bowstring. He's, he has mentally seen that arrow hit the bullseye. He's trying to program the future for the result that he wants. That's what he's focused on. He's not focused on his technique. His technique is just second nature by now. That's the way it is with any sport at the top end level. It's mostly a mental game. But here's another thing. If we had a plank of wood, say a six inch wide board, you know, a two by six, and we laid it on the floor here, all of us could probably walk from one end to the other without falling off of it. Take that same plank, make it just as steady, 200 feet in the air, and how many of us would walk from one end to the other without falling off of it? Not nearly as many. Why? Because the fear would make us clumsy. It's the same reason. The future private system can't, can't make your motion smooth because you're afraid. You're stopping, you're starting, you're, you're messing up the way the, the way the system works, so you get clumsy. Okay? And it's not just that you're fearful. Just being disengaged, just being adrift and not really focused will make you clumsy too, just to a lesser extent. Okay, so everybody gets this future data prior to it happening, but not necessarily at the intellectual level. You don't get it intellectually, and we're talking about very small amounts of time, and we're talking at very precise, minute electrochemical events inside the body. We're not talking about your, your intellect being aware of this. 
Okay, so what should we expect? Let's look at the next slide and see what we get. One, uh, which is not on the slide, but I'll tell you about, oops, did I lose it? Does it still work? No. Let's try this again. All right, that's better. There we, mm. You still got sound back there? Is that okay? Okay, let's see if this will hang in there. All right, let's go with it. Um, there was a thing called, uh, it was done in about 1982 or three, it was called the, the Bright Shaft's Potential. Some Germans figured this out, and what they, what they did is, is they found that they could, they could measure uh, readiness to move. And they did it in two ways, acute and uncued, but the cued is the most interesting. What that means is they will, let's say, ring a bell. When, it, when you hear a bell, raise your right hand. Okay? And what they would find, they'd ring bells and people would raise their right hand. What they would find when they measured these tiny little potentials, they were very tiny little things. You couldn't measure them without super sensitive equipment, was that the body actually started to get ready to move. The electrochemical process with the potentials that the muscle started to build in anticipation of moving before the bell rang. Hmm, they didn't know what to do with that, you know. And uh, matter of fact, a, a guy, uh, Labette, later, did some research on that and came to the erroneous conclusion that therefore there must be no free will because, you see, the consciousness wasn't in charge. Well, that's just wrong. That was little c consciousness, which isn't in charge of anything anyway. It's at the bottom end of the, of the line. And uh, in his experiment, uh, was, was flawed in many ways. So that shows you that we do start things before we have any reason to start them. Now, there's other things like that. Uh, Dean Radin um, had experiments that shows that the body reacts to a calm or disturbing picture seconds before that picture is shown. Okay, now again, emotional things, just like physical motion, it's a very complex electrochemical process, and whether that emotion is going to be one of a horrific picture or one of a lovely, beautiful picture, there's different kinds of things secrete from different kinds of glands and different kinds of mounts to create those different kinds of emotions. And with very precise probes, they can measure the beginning of those processes. The person is not aware of it. They don't know they're about to raise their hand or the bell's about to ring, but their body does because their body, in order to prevent video lag, is moving out early on the future probable database. So it explains all of these experiments. Okay, um, let's, um, let's go through these quickly. Oh, all of these things that are in, in uh, italics here that you see on the charts are not my words at all. This was a list posted by Dr. Craig Hogan, and it was a list of unexplainable, repeatable, well-documented scientific experiments. Okay. Um, Reverse causality. Now, we talked about that already. I'm not going to do it again, but I just want to point out what Dr. Hogan said about it to show you the, the general misunderstanding. He says, the retro intention study showing that intention somehow has an effect on an experimental group of cardiac patients. You see, intention has no effect on cardiac patients. Attention has the effect on the data about those cardiac patients. See, but because he, th he believes we live in an objective reality, he thinks the cardio, pack, the cardio patients were affected. Okay, and he mentions a Geiger counter. Somehow intention effort that uh, clicks on a Geiger counter recorded at one time can be influenced. The clicks weren't influenced. The data of those clicks were influenced. Again, you give up this objective sense that the data has to reflect what actually happened. The data is still in the future in these cases. Okay, um, that uh, consciousness uh, can affect machines that use energy, random number generators and that kind of stuff. Well, again, they're not affecting the machine. They're affecting the data that's the output of the machine. All right, uh, physical examination of artifacts of consciousness always fails. No one's ever been able to use a form of energy to interfere with telepathy or remote viewing. They put a remote viewer in a Faraday cage, which is a metal cage that basically blocks all electromagnetic activity. And they can remote view just as well in a Faraday cage as out of a Faraday cage. Well, of course, consciousness is non-physical. You can't interfere with it with physical effects. Physical things aren't going to have anything to do with it. 